Thank you for joining us this morning for live Q&A. It's almost spring here. As far as the bees are concerned, they think it is spring and they're bringing in the honey. If we have a look in the side window, we can see the nectar coming in. It's quite exciting here in Australia when the spring hits, you get a lot of honey coming in. You can see there's a mixture here of glinting nectar down the cells and capping that they've put over the honey to say that it's looking nice and ready to keep for later. So when they've got the moisture content below 20%, they will then put their wax capping over the top. It's a bit like a preserving lid on a jam jar to say that's ready for later. If you've got questions, put it in the comments below. We'll answer them while we're harvesting. Now, the last uh, month has been all about Varroa and that's been really important for the situation here in Australia. And we've been covering spring management and what you need to do to limit your hives from swarming. And another thing that is good to do is harvesting the honey. The reason why that's important is your queen, if she doesn't have anywhere to lay because there's too much honey stored in the bottom box, that could trigger the hive to swarm. Whereas if you are harvesting honey, they can shift some honey from the brood box up to the top box and make room for the queen to lay. So without further ado, let's get the honey harvest happening. We're choosing to do a, a big jar here today and we're also uh, set the shelf at this position. So you can move this depending on what jars you have. I'm just going to put the key in the bottom slot there, give it a little turn and pretty soon we'll see some honey coming down that tube. And you can do it in, in segments, it makes it a bit easier to turn the key, especially if it hasn't been done in a while and the frame parts are all uh, stuck together well with their propolis and wax. Lovely, I can just start to see it. It's a really interesting view actually down the honey tube. And look, it's nice light honey, uh, coloured honey today. So I'm expecting some beautiful floral notes here, often the light spring flavours are like a, a, like a flavour burst in your mouth with those Australian eucalypt flavours. Yum yum. We're actually just running out of honey so it's good timing to have some coming in to share with the family. If you've got questions put it in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. Isn't that gorgeous, that liquid amber, liquid gold. So nice that the bees are so prolific at, at pollinating and producing honey that we can share some too. Now if you look in the side window of this hive, you can see there's quite a lot of bees in the hive, showing us that this is a prime candidate for taking a split and doing your spring management. What we're trying to do here in Australia, it's more important than ever to limit your hive from swarming so that we can control the spread of the Varroa incursion. Ah, look, we've got a two-tone honey. So in this frame, first of all came the light honey, which was uh, what they're just bringing in now, but it looks like there was honey that was left from uh, earlier in the winter or last season. And you can see there's a darker color coming into the honey right now. It's interesting when that happens, you get a, uh, bit of a, a mix in one frame. Often you'll get separate flavours in each frame, but sometimes you'll get more than one flavour in a frame as well. It's such a beautiful thing to be able to share and taste those flavours. Any questions coming in? Yeah, we have a question from Diane Edwards. She wants to know how do you keep insects like roaches, mice and other nuisances away from the hives? Okay, so the bees are really good at keeping uh, pests out of the hive in general, except for the small hive beetle, they get past the guards. But if you've got roaches in your hive, it means your hive is either uh, really in trouble and the bees can't actually keep the roaches out because there's very few of them left. So it would be really a secondary problem. Now, in countries where you get a long cold winter, that could be a time when mice, for instance, could come in the uh, entrance where the bees fly in and out. The flow hive has a reduced entrance size, so it's less likely. I think the um, 
it, the, the main mice in the US that people have trouble with getting into their hive in the cold places in the winter actually can't get in to the entrance but please let us know if you've got experience with that and we also have an entrance reducer if you want to narrow that entrance further in in the winter time to stop things like mice getting into your hive generally the bees look after it in an area like this in this subtropical region we don't have to worry about roaches and mice and things getting into the hive and even ants won't actually go into where the bees are sometimes they'll get behind the covers which is annoying for us visually but they if ants get into the hive, the bees are very quick to chase them out. Sometimes you'll be pulling apart a hive and you'll knock a bunch of ants in off the lid and the bees will go crazy just tussling with them and kicking them out of the hive. So they're, they're very good at doing that. Another question, this is from Ross Lee mm, in Melbourne. Yeah. So if you, he's located near Melbourne, when would be the best time to do his first harvest. Okay, so Melbourne's gonna be a bit behind this area. August is when spring starts here, but as you move towards the southern parts, it's a bit later. So the time to harvest is actually when you see this honey coming in, like you can see in the rear window here. We're probably jumping the gun slightly, but I wanted to get a jump on it here because this hive is packed full of honey, no, packed full of bees, and I want them to um, have some area to, to move some honey upstairs and make room for, for new laying. So we'll probably do a split from this hive to limit the congestion. That's my favorite way to, uh, to deal with um, the congestion in a hive and limit swarming is taking a split. Back to your question, wait till you see the honey coming in and filling the frames. So the time to harvest is when your frames are full and the capping is on the frames and let the bees tell you that with how they fill the frames. Yeah, we have another quest, similar question. Someone based in New South Wales saying they've been holding off harvesting for four to five months. Could they harvest now? So it really depends what's going on in your hive. Because we know that there's flowers coming and we can see the, the nectar coming in, then that's a good time to harvest. Now, ideally you're waiting till you see the capping on. We're jumping it here and it's actually not quite ready. Ideally we would have the honey coming all the way out to the edges and the capping going on to make sure that moisture content is down below that 20% range to make sure our honey is going to keep on the shelf and not go fermented. Any more questions? Keep them coming in. Yeah, so there's a question here from Kathleen. She's in California, USA. She's saying they have a mild winter. So does she remove the queen excluder and they will, the bees will move up and eat the honey from the flow frames? Uh, okay, great. You're touching on a piece of winter management, which is if you're in a cold place and the bees need to move up through the hive to consume the honey to survive over the winter, then it's important to remove the excluder so the queen doesn't get stuck behind and perish below. Now, as you say, if you're in a mild area, then you probably don't have to do that. If, like we are here, you've got flowers that, that go almost all year round, there is times when there's not much honey, but there's always something for them. And the bees don't need to do that balling, bunkering down, waiting for the snow to pass thing. And in that case, you can probably leave the excluder in like we do year round, but ask your local beekeepers what they do in your area. And just further on th with that question, Kathleen also wants to know, just say you did move, remove the queen excluder, what happens if the queen lays up there? What do you do? Okay, so if come springtime, you've forgotten to put the excluder back in, there's, there's uh, two scenarios. One is the queen will never lay in the flow frames and I've got plenty of hives that won't. And the other one is she will lay in the flow frames and it seems to be very queen specific and you've probably got a 50-50 chance. If she does lay in the flow frames or, or you want to know whether you can run your hive without the excluder, then you'll need to check the flow frames and check that she either is or isn't laying. If you find that she is laying in the flow frames, what you'll need to do is shake all the bees off the flow frames 
back down into the bottom box, put your excluder in place and put your flow frames back in again. And that will ensure that uh, the queen is down the bottom. If you just put the excluder in, there's a chance that the queen could be up the top and stuck in the box with the flow frames and then you'll definitely get her laying in there. Okay, we have another question. So this is from Margaret Fletcher. She says, one of our hives in Brisbane was flooded. The second hive survived and we are hoping to do a split to replace our hive. But what is the best way to clean a flooded hive, especially the flow frames? It's a mess of dirt and mold. Okay, sorry to hear about the flood and glad you had one hive that survived. There was a lot of flooding we had in this area too. Beekeepers in, a beekeeper I know lost 50 hives that just simply floated away in the valley below here. It's very sad. Cleaning a flooded flow hive. Now, the best way you're going to clean the flow frames is with a gurney. So use a, um, a pressure washer and ideally a hot water pressure washer. Now, hot water pressure washers, if you try and buy one of them, are quite expensive, but what you can do is put the intake into your pressure washer, the intake hose from a nice hot water source, ideally above uh, the wax melt temperature of 63 degrees. So if you have nice 70 degree hot water, please be careful, don't burn yourself, then you'll find that that will be the best way to, to wash down those flow frames and give a fresh start again. Okay, so this is something slightly different. Leah has just sent through a um note saying that it is the heart gardening projects last week of crowdfunding okay great great so the heart gardening project is in melbourne it's something we've been supporting we'll put a, a link in below and it's a beautiful project uh, supporting lots of bee forage across melbourne so have a look at that they just won their advocacy campaign to keep street gardening legal in the city of port phillip in melbourne Lovely, that's such, such good news and such important work. Imagine a world where the place was a garden, where life could flourish everywhere, where food was being produced everywhere. It's certainly where we need to go as a species. If you've got questions, put them in the comments and we will answer those. It's all about answering your questions and helping you get started in the amazing world of beekeeping. Okay, so we have another question. This is from Northern California. Gary's asking, he says, we probably have one more honey flow before we shut it down for winter. I just put my flow frames on and hoping to get some honey, but I may end up with partially filled frames. If there are flow frames that are not ready to harvest by the end of the flow, what should I do with them over winter? Okay, the very best thing to do with them would be to put them in a deep freeze. If you happen to have a deep freezer, put your flow frames in, that'll keep them good and then you can put them back on again in the springtime when the time is right and it's ready to put your super back on again. If you don't have that and perhaps you're in a cold enough area, you might be able to just put them in a tub and keep them outside where it's going to be nice and cool for the winter. The danger of leaving them outside in a more temperate climate is that that honey will ferment and go manky and you get mold and then you've got a clean up process come the springtime. So deep freeze if you can. And Margaret's just gotten back to us um, she asked the question previously about the flooded hive. She's just asking, um, can you please tell her more about mold, like how she can clean the hive of mold? Okay, so to clean, we talked about the flow frames now, and I assume now you're talking about the woodenware. So the hive got flooded, full of dirt, mold, and so on. Now, bees are pretty good at keeping their hive clean, but if you want to assist them, I guess it's a case of cleaning woodenware as you would do any outdoor woodenware where you need to, um, where, you, where you can get off the, the mildew. Now, there's a product called Oxygen Bleach which does get used for that purpose 
um, you wear gloves and you get a bit of a scrubber and you can scrub um, mildew off wooden surfaces, be it outdoor furniture or beehives. There's another um, thing you could do and that's um, use some sandpaper, but generally your bees will keep the inside of the hive uh, clean anyway. So it's great that you're getting that hive back on its feet and getting it going. So uh, as we talked earlier, clean the flow frames and if you want to give them a helping hand, you could um, uh, sand or clean the wood on the inside of the box as well. And you might like to do the outside and give it a re-coat of um, an outdoor decking product or a good quality house paint.
except for me. Yeah. You can okay. just clip it into the um, unplugged eggs. Oh, this one won't play. No, the other one. Oh, yeah. This one. One, two, one, two, testing. Give me the thumbs up if you can hear the audio again. Sorry about that. The little widgets went flat that are sending the audio to the phone. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you can hear the audio. Um, okay, so no audio yet by the look of it. Okay, thank you. We're back on. Come and have a look at this, Callum in the window of this hybrid hive. I've just popped the window and they've been building some naturally drawn comb here. And look at the differences in cell size. Here you have a 5.3 millimeter typical foundation that they do use for brood and also honey. And across here you've got much bigger uh, cells which they will often build bigger cells when they're away from the, uh, from the brood nest because it stores more honey and that's why the flow frames are a bit bigger in size. Now these are a bit bigger again up to what's drone size so we're beyond the flow frame size of about six millimeters and now we're pushing into uh, 6.5 millimeters there. So really interesting to watch how they morph between one cell size and another there. There was a question about it a couple of weeks back and this is a really beautiful example of how and look they're starting to store honey in the top here in these large cells but large cells is more efficient for honey storage so that's why they'll do that further away from the brood nest and that's why flow frames are that size any more questions coming in okay you can see the bees in the window here how crowded they are so we need to take a split or this hive will start raising their queen cells and likely to swarm so important to uh, do your spring management here and this is a prime candidate here we are we're not even in spring yet and the numbers are really building up lovely mm, we've just got a bee that found the honey so what we might do is cover up the honey jar you don't want to leave honey out for the bees um, and if you've got hungry bees that are looking for honey instead of nectar you can start what's called robbing where the bees will actually go looking for honey instead of nectar once they get a taste for it so to avoid that it's good to to prepare yourself with some kind of kitchen wrap or in this case it's a, a wax honeybee wrap you can just cover it up and that way this will mean no bees can get into the honey jar especially if you need to walk away and you're not monitoring the situation, then just make sure you've got your honey covered. So Darren Smith on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland is asking, saying in preparation for spring, is we're going to remove the honeycomb from the outer frames in the brood box and relocate empty frames closer to the center of the brood box. His question is, what if those frames have some capped drone brood and or the honey in those frames is largely uncapped? Okay, so great, great idea. Now, uh, if you dial back a couple of weeks in our live stream, we showed you how to do that in spring management. So what you're doing, which is great, is, is taking some honey frames from the edge and either if they're naturally drawn combs, you can simply cut the comb out right then and there and put the frames back towards the middle. If you're doing foundation, you'll need to pre-prepare your foundation frames and uh, swap those out. Now, if you have a frame you want to take out, but it's still got a bit of brood on it, then if you just take that away, then that brood will die, which isn't good. So you either wait till it's just honey on the edge, which is often the case, or a, a little trick you could do if you really want to swap it out there and don't want to wait and come back is you will you can take that frame and actually put it under the roof take the plug out of the inner cover and the bees will get up there and they'll look after that brood in the uh, roof cavity now just prop up the frame so it's not sitting straight on the inner cover just with a couple of little twigs to 
to make sure there's a little gap under the comb surface. And even though it's on its side, the bees will just go about servicing the frame. And um, next week you probably come back and all, the, all of the brood will have hatched and joined the hive or emerged from their cells. And then you will be able to take that frame away. So there's a little hack you could do. If you've got the hybrid, you could just shift it up for one of these frames so you could swap them and take a frame from the bottom and move it up to the window here. Now if you've got uncapped honey like this, then uh, the best thing I would recommend is cut that up for cheese platters. It looks fantastic when it's almost capped and you've got all of those beautiful glistening hexagons. And if you want to keep it for a while because your party's not for a few weeks, then put that in the fridge and it'll keep a lot longer, even if the honey isn't quite at that uh, acceptable moisture content yet. And could you please um, answer that question about the condensation again, because that's when the audio went off. Ah, great. So condensation is a natural thing that happens. Now, uh, when humid air comes into contact with a cool surface, then that air can't, as it cools, it can't hold so much moisture and a little water droplet will collect on the cool surface. Now that's a normal thing that happens in beehives. If you've got a conventional beehive, you won't be able to see it because you don't have the windows. Now, if it's happening on one hive but not the other, as you were saying, then it's possible that one hive's got a lot more bees than the other and the bees are simply um, taking away that condensation of effect as they move about in the top box. It's not something you need to worry about particularly unless your, your hive is dripping wet and it's really cold and you don't want cold wet bees but otherwise don't worry about it. The bees will actually use it as a water source in the hive and it's normal to have a bit of condensation on those cooler nights. Wales would like to know what is the average time the girls take for a foraging trip? Okay, so it really depends how far they are going. Bees fly at about 35 kilometres per hour, which is pretty quick for a tiny little insect. They're beating their wings about 240 cycles a second, and they're, they're going for it. So they can be quite quick if the flowers are close, if you do the maths on the distance but they can fly up to 10 kilometers if they're hungry but, hungry, but generally they'll stay within a three kilometer radius and they'll be bringing that back to the hive. So a foraging bee will usually do multiple trips to the flowers and back per day. And they could visit up to 2,000 flowers. So if you've got a really strong colony with 50,000 bees and half of them go out to the flowers, and the flowers are a kilometre away, then you could get 50 million flowers pollinated in a day. Absolutely extraordinary pollinators. And that's why humans have dragged them all around the world wherever they go, because they're such extreme pollinators, they can now pollinate very quickly a whole massive almond orchard and allow that almond orchard to set fruit. So they become an integral part of our food chain. And it's just amazing to think about the maths because that amount of flight from that one hive, if you add up the amount of bee flight, it's actually several times around the world. Extraordinary. Jason would like to know if you would recommend using eco wood treatment on the flow hive body. Okay, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the eco wood is a uh, graying agent to get the um, uh, wood to, to, to go gray. Now, if you're using the Western Red Cedar, you can do that sort of thing on your hive and it will, um, you can just go with the gray look and it will accelerate that process rather than waiting a couple of years for it to go that beautiful silvery gray color. If you're using the Aracaria, like this one is, then we really recommend an outdoor house paint to be used because it will go more mildewy more easily. 
Now, I've probably got that wrong with the eco wood treatment, so let us know what it is and how you go with it if you do plan to give it a go. Okay, I'm not 100% sure I understand your question, but certainly you can add new queens to your hive. Uh, oh, I see. If you can't find the old queen in the hive, how do you add a new queen? Right. So, that is a bit tricky. If you just add a new queen to your hive and there's an old queen in there, your new queen won't survive. You actually need to find the old queen, take her away for what uh, is best to do for 24 hours before adding the new queen. The new queen comes in a little queen cage with five escort bees, a block of candy at the end, and that's to delay the, uh, the releasing of her into the hive. So you put her in, the bees chew away at the candy, meanwhile they're getting used to her scent. Because the old scent is gone, they've realised they're queenless, and the scent of the new queen is then being introduced slowly. And that's how the, the, you get much better acceptance from your hive if um, they've got that little delay of that scent um, and time to get used to it. So you do need to find the old queen before introducing a new one or the new one will perish. Now you can get into a situation where you don't have a queen and that's a good time to introduce a new one but have a look if there's no presence of eggs or young larvae then your hive is probably without a queen and then you can go and introduce the new queen to your hive. Now, if you have trouble finding the queen, it is a daunting task at first, then get some help from a more experienced beekeeper to help you find her. You can also uh, get a bit of a jump on that by doing some queen spotting. If you have a look at some of our Instagrams, or there's a great book by Hilary Kearney, which is called Queen Spotting, which it, it helps you uh, identify what a queen looks like in amongst thousands of bees. Any more questions? Look at this cool artwork on this hive. Any more questions coming in? We will um, answer them as we go. Having a few technical problems here this morning, but um, we'll get to uh, answering them as soon as we can. Um, Isn't it beautiful to marvel in it, the, the uh, bees and see them bring in the nectar, that's a really good thing to watch the nectar come in because it's now springtime here and you can see the bees fanning their wings, look at that, isn't that beautiful? They're actually doing the job of drying out the honey in the comb. Margaret has messaged in said her surviving hive has struggled and she took off the super. She's feeding them a sugar syrup mix. They weren't getting they went getting up into the roof, so she's taken the board off and placed a container of sugar directly on top of the brood frames. Is this okay? Hoping this warm weather will be enough to boost them for a spring honey flow. Has she done the right thing? Okay, so feeding bees. We've got a video saying how to make a bee feeder if you have a look on our YouTube channel. And there's some ideas of how to make one that goes uh, through the um, inner cover. So you can get a jar, put some holes in the lid, put a nice uh, uh, syrup in there with cooking up some, some sugar, water and sugar together. Now, if it's a springtime and you're wanting to simulate nectar, it'll be a one-to-one -one ratio, what's called a thin syrup, to feed them. And you can tip a jar upside down and the bees will suck the nectar out of those little holes. You can also make a simple feeder really quickly with a Ziploc bag. You put the syrup in, you put it on the inner cover, take the plug out, put some pinholes in it, and the bees will come up. Now, what I think you've done is you've taken off the honey super and you've put a container full of sugar syrup right on top of the brood frames. Now, you must have another box on top to house that. Um, 
unless you are feeding through the inner cover. So it's a good idea to feed in such a way that bees can't drown in syrup. And I'm not sure what you've done, but if you've just got a container of syrup right in with the bees, then you might find a whole lot of bees will pile in there and the more bees will pile on top and lots of bees will die in the syrup. So the better way to do it is feed through the inner cover hole. Now, having said that, we don't need to feed bees here in this area because there's always something around. It's pretty rare when, if we have to feed bees. But in some areas, and like you said, you've got a weak hive that needs a bit of a help, you might decide to feed your bees. And another prime time to feed bees is if you're in a country where you've got a long cold winter, the bees don't have many stores in their hive, so they may not last the winter. Then you feed what's called a thick syrup, which is two to one, so twice as much sugar as water. You cook that up and you feed that to the bees and they will store that as if it's honey for later. And that'll give the bees something to survive on during that winter time. Have a look at uh, feeding bees on our YouTube channel for some ideas there. But good on you for looking after your bees. Any more questions? So James from New York wants to know why his bees are only filling the outer flow super frames and the top few rows of the inner frames without touching the bottom two thirds of the inner flow super frames. It's looking like a brood pattern with honey on top. Okay, that can happen. It's, um, it's usually when the bees have gotten hungry and they've taken some honey out of the area above the brood nest. So typically that'll be happening when your bees need some more honey to feed to their young brood. Bees will use about a frame of honey and a frame of pollen to raise a frame of brood. So uh, you'll find in some cases you'll get what looks like a moon shape, a half moon shape in your frame with no honey. As the flowers come on again, they'll fill that back in again. But it is something to be aware of when you're harvesting a bit early like we are and you might find that there's sections of the frame that don't have any honey or they might have nectar that's not quite ready in it. If they do have nectar that's not quite ready then it just means that your honey will come out with a too high moisture content. You'll either need to consume it or keep it in the fridge so fermentation doesn't occur. But uh, it's basically the bees have used that honey and it'll take some time for the bees to fill it in again when the nectar flow comes on. Um, we just had a message saying no sound. No sound again. Okay. Ask for a thumbs up. Okay, sorry, we're having some technical trouble with our microphones this morning. Thank you very much for tuning in and asking so many great questions. Let us know what you'd like us to cover uh, next week and we'll be back again, same time, same place. And uh, happy beekeeping if you're here in Australia with the springtime. Thanks for watching.